live? All right, I think we are live and ready to go. So welcome everyone so much to the session on delivering social justice in the new economy. We all know that with the struggles the world has been facing in the last 15 months and the ongoing pandemic, that the inequalities that are being faced in all countries, developed and developing, are only widening. And so the question for discussion today is, what are the roots we have to narrow the scope of the inequity that we are experiencing around the world and in each country in the world? How do we ensure better and more equitable financing, food, water, shelter, psychological support, and healthcare? We've got a fantastic panel today. I'm gonna to briefly introduce everyone and then we're gonna get going. And uh, we've got a very dynamic 45 minutes to get the benefit of the expertise of this full group. So first, let me introduce Mariana Vescontels, the Chief Executive Officer of AgroSart in Brazil. Karen Guggenheim, the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of the World Happiness Summit, a well-being advocate. Salman Ravella, a partner with Piscone Ravella, who's focused on policy and equity for all of us, based out of Manhattan. And Diana Mao, co-founder and president of Nomi Networks, who focuses on uh, entrepreneurship, women's empowerment, making sure that we all have an equal chance of success and freedom in our lives. And I'm Wendy Woods, Vice Chairman, responsible for social impact and sustainability with the Boston Consulting Group. I'm gonna quickly move to the panel, but I wanted to say a couple things as I kick off the uh, situation around the world and what we're grappling with as it relates to inequity and COVID. And that really has to do with uh, vaccine. And I wanna highlight that as one of the examples where we are seeing some of the most challenging equity around the world, both within countries and between countries. Um, I and a couple other panelists have the privilege right now of being in the US where vaccination rates in some of the states are topping 70%. And yet we have places around the world that are grappling with the pandemic in a much, much, much more serious way and are just at the very beginning of what we call an S curve, right? Even getting any access to the vaccine that will allow the most vulnerable in society a chance at getting vaccinated. It's one of the examples that we highlight that calls out the things that we need to address in the world, because I think we've all learned through this pandemic that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And finding ways to make sure that we can create access to vaccines in those places where the pandemic is most rampant and therefore the variants and the evolution of the virus is actually uh, riskiest not just in those places, but frankly, for the world as a whole. And finding ways to do that, we're accelerating. The good news is there are a number of countries that have made dramatic escalations in the dose sharing and the dose donations that they're making the vaccines for the companies that had the privilege to be able to purchase doses early. But there is so much more we need to do, not just in terms of how we share the capacity of the vaccines along the world, how we actually manage the tech transfer for vaccines over time to build capacity in other parts of the world, but also how we support the rollout. We know that large scale rollout of this has been a challenge everywhere and it will be a, continue to be a challenge for many places around the world. So I just wanna highlight the needs of healthcare, the example of the vaccine and the importance in finding more equitable ways to create access to vaccines for all the citizens in the countries that have had access and frankly, globally across the world where it's so needed. But Mariana, I wanted to hand to you. Um, you're the CEO and the um, founder of an organization that has uh, thought really creatively about how to help make agriculture much more productive, um, much more, uh, Effective, a better source of livelihoods for some of the, the smaller farmers. Um, and, you know, frankly, agriculture being the source for much of the poorer populations in the world for their livelihoods, I think the digital transformation that you're unlocking is so important. And would love to hear you talk about the ways that we can close the inequity that exists in food and agriculture. 
No, totally. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Such an important topic. And I'm very happy to bring the vision of agriculture to social justice. Uh, many times people forget uh, how that can be linked. And we only think about financial access and labor and food is so important, right? Uh, and when we go to the smallholder farmers and check the realities, uh, many times those farmers are producing food that they cannot afford, right? Like they export all of the food, they sell their food and they cannot eat the food they produce. So that's why it's so important for us to bring farmers up uh, and actually transform the agro in agribusiness, right? For each country to be able to generate income and social justice. Uh, what we believe is like uh, farmers and agriculture are facing major challenges nowadays in how to increase food production so we can feed almost 10 billion people in 2050, how to handle uh, the limitations of land, water and climate change. So they are under a huge pressure to adapt and at the same time they have to do that. There is a demand for traceability, for transparency, so they have to show what they're doing and they cannot do that alone. They, they don't have the resources to do that alone. And that's why I advocate for the digital transformation because I really believe in the power of data to allow farmers to better understand their crops and therefore make better decisions that will allow them to produce more and to be more sustainable. And one of the ways we, we believe we can make it work is through collaborating with the whole food supply chain. So I believe industries have a very important role in engaging farmers and bringing them together and allowing them to have access so we can only reach directly, for example, uh, the, the small holders in a greater impact when they are connected, because it's very hard and expensive to find those farmers that are offline or distributed everywhere. So it's really important to engage with cooperatives and food companies that are sourcing from them in order to find them and allow access. Uh, but we still see many challenges on, on how to scale that impact, right? And the first one is infrastructure. Connectivity is very poor in the majority of the emerging countries. So the, the majority of the farmers do not have internet in the field and that prevent them from accessing tools that could be supporting that transformation of their business. And there is always a, a, a play. Everyone throws the balls on whose responsibility it is to allow for connectivity in the field, the private sector against the government. And I believe it's a matter of finding the right business model and getting everyone engaged. The second one is education. Right? Like it's not enough to just have AI and sensors and everything else. We need to teach people how to use it, starting from the schools and the labor force of the agronomists, but also for each farmer. It's literally uh, creating digital literacy as the majority of them can barely read but it should be able to connect you know, to an app and know what to do and, and how to transform. And, and the last uh, uh, challenge is around financing. How can we allow for financing lines for them to adopt technology and to continue investing in their business? Now, everyone pushes for sustainability and stop deforestation and, and transitioning to a regenerative agriculture model. If there is no financing, there is no way to make that happen. And that's a problem everywhere, but emerging countries struggle even more. So I would like to invite everyone to to think about it and think on their role in society and how they can get engaged with the industry to provide improvements on these three pillars, I would say, so that we can scale technology access and help farmers to produce more. I think you're new to it. One would have hoped that by this point in uh, remote, I would have had that figured out. Um, but I want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, our last panelist to join us. And thank you so much, Miriam Robinson, uh, the president and CEO of the First Global Bank in Jamaica. Um, and I'd love to handle you if you're uh, ready to talk, because I think that we just had the perfect setup for you um, when we talked about agriculture as part of it, but we also need financing. Um, and in the role that you have, you've thought so much about financing and financial inclusion, um, but also about, um, as we were hearing about so eloquently, you know, the role of education in all of this, which I know is a personal passion for you. Right. So, Hi, hi, Wendy. Was that that was for me? I think I, I my connection isn't so good. I'm sorry for joining late, and connection isn't so good. Um, really pleased to be here. And um, do you remind me of the question? 
Yeah, I would I just, we, we were talking about how do you actually reduce inequities in the world, both within countries and across countries. And I think financial inclusion is such an important enabler. And I know you've been able to accelerate that. Love to hear you talking about that. And then a bit about the contribution of education of doing that same, of narrowing the inequities. Not, I'm not hearing the technical question. Can everybody else hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, Miriam, I'm going to give you a minute to work on your connection. Um, and what I'll do is actually move to Diana. And Miriam, if your connection uh, strengthens, just please let us know. Um, Diana, would love to hear from you. You've worked so much on uh, women's empowerment. Uh, their ability to work, their freedom, the eliminating human trafficking, and just frankly, the entrepreneurship dimensions and the economic viability that gives uh, individuals and women their resilience. Would love to hear how you think about that and narrowing the inequities in the world. Yeah, I think COVID has been an interesting season. We work in areas where there's no running water or electricity in India. Um, and also in Cambodia in urban and semi-urban areas. And so, um, you know, with the shutdown in India and the current COVID crisis has really widened the gap even more for the women that we serve living mostly below a dollar a day. And so we've seen the power of, you know, training and a job really increasing their daily income, you know, to $5 to $7 a day. That's such a game changer for, you know, their household and especially their children. Um, and so I will say that we've pivoted towards technology. And um, two years ago, thankfully, we digitalized about three months of our curriculum, thanks to partnership with Vodafone. And so during COVID, we really accelerated that path and deployed that curriculum to not just, you know, one site, but seven of our training sites in India. And now coming into the U.S. as well, we've been invited to start working with uh, a government entity in Dallas specifically. Um, and so workforce is on top of mind, especially for, you know, seeking justice because the power of earning, the power of being able to break out of the cycles of poverty um, is also needed in the United States, uh, especially among the population that we'll be serving, which is mostly black and Latinx girls that are caught up in juvenile detention. So I will say that COVID has presented itself very difficult for the jobs that typically will absorb talent that is illiterate, semi-literate, you know, are at a very um, high level of barriers to work. But at the same time, there's opportunities and companies stepping up that we're partnering with large um, international corporations that are willing to kind of look um, beyond their typical norm of recruitment process and even hire high school interns that have a criminal record. And so we are also seeing that kind of political will from the top down within these corporations. And Diana, I'd love to understand a bit about um, how you have had the sort of acceptance, how a lot of times um, I think organizations think about taking innovations from the most developed countries to the emerging markets or the developing countries, right? I mean, you've actually done a bit of the reverse, right? In a very powerful way. I'd love to just hear how you've thought about that, how that's been received. Yeah, I mean, human trafficking, the numbers, uh, according to UN and other sources, are over 40 million uh, men and women in slavery and about half the population of those in slavery in India. So yeah, it made sense, you know, in terms of our client to focus on India and Asia. But we are seeing really a growth, sadly, of human trafficking, um, especially along the south of the border coming into the U.S. as well, of cases of human trafficking, which is what led to kind of our intervention and program being very relevant also to the U.S. because there are so many opportunity youth that, frankly, um, are having a hard time getting jobs. And there are, you know, at least nearly a million of jobs now available <laughs> in the U.S. And those that are needed the most aren't really gaining the access they need and understandably because of their major barriers and psychological trauma. And so it's really important to address that. And so trauma, you know, whether it's 
being um, actually a slave, literally in slave-like conditions in India, um, you know, in brick kilns and just really harsh conditions uh, versus in the U.S. being caught up in the juvenile justice detention system because of major trauma within their family unit. Um, which led to their running away, which led to them being caught up in the cycle of poverty, which led to them stealing something, which had led to them being incarcerated. So you see kind of a lot of similarities in the individual person and the major challenges that they have to overcome. Um, and so I see that as very parallel, actually, between the girls that we're serving in Dallas and also the women and girls that are making less than a dollar a day, you know, on average, if they even have a job at all in these very rural communities and in these cycles of slavery. So it's very uh, similar. And so we've seen just even a 200% increase in their salary, what that difference can make. And similarly in the US also, um, we're hoping that there will be also those great outcomes. Great, thank you. And Salman, I'd love to come to you because, you know, as a lawyer and as someone who has worked on advocacy from a policy perspective, right, the role of governments, the role of public sector, the role of policy in actually creating the framework to enable all this, right, as opposed to constrain all of this is so important. And would love to hear how you think about this and, and reactions to some of the comments you've, uh, you've heard so far would be great. Sure, and, and, and thank you again for having me. It's nice to see you again, Wendy. Um, you know, I want to step back a little bit and, and lay the groundwork as you did at the beginning of this, which is we could all agree with, with premise number one, or rather reality number one, which is there is a widening of inequalities, correct? And that is visible across the globe. And we operate under this cloud, if you will, of the pandemic is global, right? There's an overall increase in poverty, but there's a special focus on minority communities. And I could cite reports upon reports that say the same thing again and again, which is people in rural communities, people of color, and those with lower incomes have been hit the highest, have been hit the most. The second premise or reality that I think we're dealing with is, is that there is a new economy. So, so what's next here and what's this question of, of the hour, which is, you know, how do we create positive economic impact that's equitable and inclusive from a policy standpoint, as you asked? And the second cloud under which I want to operate, uh, for me at least, is uh, while the pandemic's global, the response is local. That's really something I want to try and emphasize. And I have several points I'd like to make on this. One, uh, obviously, I think this is known, incentivizing businesses to do not only better, but to do bigger and better. And of course, no better expert than yourself, our Madam Chair here on this topic, and you could talk at length about the benefits of uh, businesses doing good. The other piece of it is uh, ethical and emphatic political choices. What do I mean by that? I, I, I think uh, we've seen programs policies by government that have fast-tracked certain things, like in the United States, the PPP round one of the loans, round two of the loans. Despite its troubles, that was fast-tracked. I think governments need to communicate this, that there is partnership available, and we're here to deliver services to our citizens, and we're going to ignore parts of the red tape, number one. Number two is uniformity including within the public-private partnership framework, such as, at least for me, the legal framework or what I call the doing business framework or making the doing business piece of it easy so businesses can work in an easy manner. While we're doing all of this, I think policy has to keep in mind the UN uh, 2030 goals, but also gender equality and human rights across the board. Um, Number three point is understanding local demographics. Uh, you know, we heard this earlier, sharing of information is important, very, very important here globally, but also within local communities. Uh, I am big on this consensus building idea. So I think we have to, from a policy standpoint, we're already doing this in certain areas, engage local community groups. And I mean non-profit non leaders, faith-based leaders, uh, you know, minorities, young people, elderly, uh, but also connecting minority groups to each other, right? Because there is an ease of sharing practices when it's coming sort of at this, at the at sort of the vertical level, uh, 
instead of from top down, right? So people are more easily able to share best practices. But one last thing that I, I haven't really read a lot about is governments and policymakers need to communicate their good work uh, with appropriate messaging and imaging. And, and I don't mean to turn this into a governments need to do better marketing. I think governments need to showcase what they've done and the good work they've done post pandemic. And once you communicate that, you know, everybody can celebrate and understand what the leader are doing, if they are doing the right thing. Uh, obviously there are issues and challenges where, where we're critical of our governments, where we think they could do better, but where the right work has been done, I think good work and a good PR strategy and good communication of those uh, achievements or accolades need to be translated. Uh, I'll jump in and I'll take another minute to look at some examples of public-private partnerships and policies that have worked. Uh, very briefly, I'll go to the pre-pandemic world and we'll look at, at least here in the United States under President Clinton, we had this Welfare, uh, Welfare Reform Act uh, in 1996 where uh, a large number of Americans, including minority populations, lost critical benefits. The government worked with private sector businesses such as UPS and Lowe's to create and hire or retain employees that had lost critical benefits. And I think the number was somewhere around 400 or 500,000 uh, staffers or workers that had lost this critical benefit were then hired by these private companies under this uh, under this public-private partnership example. In the post-COVID world, uh, we'll stay within the United States and head west out to California. In Oakland, California, we had the Cities Fund for Public uh, Innovation that took just three days to set up and raise several million dollars. And within 10 days, they had provided funds in four key areas which are addressed in our topic for today, or at least some of them, food security, homelessness, community health and education. Uh, and what worked there is really what I outlined earlier, which is working and emphasizing local relationships, existing relationships, collective expertise, which is again, the idea of sharing information, but also creating consensus and trust and having community advisory groups. Uh, if somebody wants to study that, it's the Oakland, California Public Fund, and it focused on equity and inclusion. So that may be a good sample for somebody that's interested to study that. Um, I'll pause here, but in closing, I want to say uh, the following. Where do we go from here? Uh, you know, number one, I think, again, for me, is empowering local communities. And number two is making sure that um, home ownership is made easy and, 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 and the digital divide is broken up. All of us are very comfortable now working from home and we could really make some good connections. We're already doing it now for a year and a half. So finding a way to break the digital divide and, and empowering people to own homes, I, how it happens, I don't know. But, but I think home ownership could create a generational impact that I think is needed here, especially for minority communities to create equity and inclusion. I'll pause here. Thank you. So and you gave us some great examples of where there is progress, right? And that, that makes us all inspired. Um, you raised the digital divide. Um, we heard uh, from Mariana how important, right, the, the access is, the ability of access to internet and digital services and making progress. Do you have any uh, examples, thoughts, advice on what are the conditions that are gonna enable us to do more closing of that digital divide? You know, I, I, I don't, that's really not my expertise. I, 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 I don't, but I think when, at least in the United States, we often have this idea of philanthropy, whether it's in dollars or in technology sharing, going outwards, uh, right, from the United States as a donation or as philanthropy from a developed nation to a developing nation. I think when we look at technology and the digital divide, we often have to look at being the recipients, quite frankly, and I think we need to look at talent which we do under the immigration scheme here and talent comes into the United States. But we also look, need to look at philanthropy from a digital divide perspective or question to see what's happening outside of the United States, what's happening outside of Silicon Valley and what's happening overseas that can be brought into the, to the United States. So I, 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 I really do <laughs> you know, struggle with this idea that we have this sort of uh, developing world contributing to the developed. But I think there's a lot of fascinating things happening overseas 
that can be brought in uh, to the United States to break up or to build rather the uh, or strengthen the digital divide. Yeah, and it's certainly an area where the public-private partnerships you reference become incredibly important. Um, Karen, I'd like to move to you. And as founder of the World Happiness Summer Summit, as a well-being advocate, I mean, clearly we've heard so much through the pandemic about languishing, right? About places where we haven't had a sense of progress, where well-being isn't present in too many different ways. I would love to hear from you about how we can make progress on narrowing the inequities in making progress on well-being and and actually fulfilling that, that happiness mandate. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone. Um, just the conversation is really wonderful. Thank you for your contributions. Um, much of my work actually centers around bringing the science behind happiness and well-being and making a business case for happiness and making a community case for happiness, right? Our, our, our goal is to go from a me culture to a we culture. So we've, we've been talking about uh, fairness, access, trust, I think we haven't touched upon, but trust is a huge component or lack of trust as well. And uh, fairness and trust is highly correlated with a sense of well-being, right? A subjective well-being. So um, I, I think uh, we need a language. Yeah, I think Simon was talking about language. We need a language of well-being and a vocabulary, right? So that we can start to measure uh, properly the results. And then we need a context. So we talk about policies and we talk about reforms and we talk about tools. But we need to bring a context as to why we're doing this. We're doing this because we want people to be to feel better, to, to experience life better. That's why we're doing it. It's very difficult to prosper if we are, you know, we have a toxic environment, whether that is between people or an environmental uh, disaster or or something along those lines. So it, it's about bringing awareness as to what we mean by these policies and starting to measure beyond the GDP. So the GDP is one measurement, one important measurement of country success, but what about education? What about um, social impact? What about a, a poverty or a, 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 in the sense of a po poverty, financial poverty, but also I think a poverty of integrity and of ethics. You know, I think that um, we've we've largely been accustomed to navigating what is what is um, legal or illegal versus what is what should be what is ethical to do. We don't teach children ethics anymore. We're talking about the advanced countries, right? <laughs> Uh, so how advanced are we if we're not teaching ethics? We're not teaching right or wrong. And then we have, yes, you're, we're talking about the digital divide, but a lot of, a lot of the digital consumption in um, wealthy countries is really toxic to children. You know, we don't talk about in the United States how the suicide rate of adolescents has skyrocketed in the last 15 years, the wealthiest country in the world. And children are dying by their own hands. Right. So I think that we really need to open this up to a, um, a, a broader sense and an umbrella of why we're doing these initiatives. So then we have a cohesive kind of strategy and we can communicate success and we should communicate success. But what is success? Success, um, in my opinion, has to take into account uh, the way that we relate each other, the way that our children are learning, the way, you know, health care. Um, it's very simple to just use one metric and to say your country is what is successful or not successful. Now, um, in developing countries, well-being is pegged to uh, to the GDP, right? It's it it, go, it goes up uh, it, it linearly it together, but not in developed countries. As a matter of fact, to a certain point, you have an inverse relationship between um, a continued accumulation of wealth and life satisfaction. So I, I really believe that we have an opportunity with the, with the COVID pandemic. I think that in our collective trauma, there's an opportunity to do something better and to highlight um, the fact that mental health is really important. And, in, and as we improve mental health, then we have a greater capacity to then address these super complicated problems. I mean, we have really hard problems to, I was born in Nicaragua, so I understand, I understand poverty. And, you know, God knows when we'll be able to vaccinate in my country. But, um, 
But so I, I, I understand that at the same time, there is a lot that we can do to become aware, to become personally aware, to bring this awareness to organizations and companies. Corporate awareness is so important. Um, and then to bring the awareness to countries so that we can have well-being part of a country's agenda. And it should be as important as everything else that we're doing. It should be the parameter of how we judge everything else because the out really should be for the well-being of our citizens. And, and, and I think that we have somehow lost that because we're so committed in the individual problems, which are very, very large. But I think that we need to communicate around this, this concept of how are we um, as a country performing on the well-being um, of, of citizens. Are there places or areas where you see progress? I mean, you said it so eloquently when you talked about uh, me culture to we culture. I mean, to me, that encapsulates you know, everything and all of the logic of how you move from more inequity, more inequality to less. Right. Where do you actually see examples of progress you would bring in? Where do you actually see that happening in ways that we can all learn from? So um, it's interesting. I, on, on a, some countries just do it better because that's their culture. So with, for example, with happiness, you have universal sense of happiness and a cultural and, of course, individual. So the Nordic countries, they always rank very high on the World Happiness Report because they have a higher uh, sense of trust in government, trust in each other, trust in the system. Um, the equality is, is, is kind of better between a, a gender, a gender equality is closer. Um, they have other, uh, other problems as, as every other country does. But I think you're beginning to see it to a certain degree in, in companies. Now they're really starting to wake up and where you had all the disengagement from before, but the pain point of the pandemic and with the pandemic, by the way, we have seen so many of the physical, um, outcomes, but we have yet to see the mental uh, consequences of what's coming. Now, there are so many things that we can do about that, but we have to, we have to understand that it's something that it's there and that it's happening, whether we see it or not. We have to address mental health issues. And by the way, it, it happens, it, it, it mental health uh, problems does not discriminate by, by, uh, by income. So it happens at all levels. And so, um, there's uh, school systems that are beginning to, to do that, to bring in well-being or happiness curriculum, as it were, into, into, the, um, into the, the, the school districts to teach mindfulness, to teach about um, how to tackle happiness. So to pursue happiness, you have to pursue it indirectly. It's like looking at the sun. If you look at it directly, it lines you. So what you do is you pursue it indirectly. You look at your relationships, um, your physical well-being, spiritual well-being, um, relational, um, your connection with uh, meaning, with, uh, with the work that you're doing, your financial well-being is incredibly important. That's one of the issues that we've been talking about here today. And so it's kind of this basket that you're looking at, but when a, a country per se is not doing uh, like a really great job that I can point out to because, you know, we need a minister of well-being. We need to have, in, in, in each company, we need somebody in charge of that position, not the HR department who then gets piled on that on, on their lap. We need to notice that that is important in and of itself as, as the other uh, uh, cabinet members have their own specialties. We need to make this part of, of what... Uh, leadership looks like at the highest level th throughout all the systems. I'm going to remember that ministers for well-being. So, Mariana, I want to come back to you. Um, Karen's talked about the importance of trust and fairness, and I feel like so much of um, what can enable that and help build that is the transparency that we've had a number of us talk about. That visibility, right? I mean, you with the work that you're doing. You know, with sensing and mining data and being able to use it and both for, uh, you know, the farmers about like their fields, but more broadly in terms of the overall agricultural uh, potential, I guess I'll say, it feels like such an enabler, like the work you're doing with digitally is such an enabler of transparency, of trust, 
And I'd love to just hear a little bit more from you in terms of how you see this in terms of the cascade effect, the enabling effect that that can have. Oh, I think that's essential for us to grow. I think we need to move from a society that competes to a society that collaborates, right? And that's what we see in farming level. It's like there is so much that farmers can learn with each other, but there is still this spirit that they shouldn't share, even though it doesn't make sense because it's not like one farmer can compete with another farmer, but that's a spirit that you have inhabiting it. Like they don't like to share their data because they, they compete to be the best one in the rank, right? And many times they miss the opportunity of collaborating. And I think like educating that, that you can actually learn a lot if you give your data and you access benchmarks and you, you can predict things that will happen to your farm, will bring you better results. And you having better results and someone else having better results do not result in one of you being less. So I think there's a whole mindset change that is important and there's a path to build there. That's why we need to, to work on communities. And that's why like, we are moving from being a data platform that, to be a network because we need these people to be part of the same and they are connected so they are empowered. Uh, on the other side of the supply chain, that's clearer because that's how consumers make choices, right? Like we trust a brand. We would trust Nestle or Coca-Cola or Cargill or anyone it depends on our relationship with each brand and how they're able to show us that they are producing our food sustainable, if they're respecting the labor laws and compliance, if they're respecting the environmental uh, conditions that they are there, they're not uh, cutting out trees to be able to, to source their goods from. So this is something that has been broken. And I think like the trust on the other side of the consumer and the brands have awakened to that and to how that is important, how building that trust with the consumer is so relevant to gain it, to gain market share and, and evolving that they are now trying to implement and bring knowledge to their supply chain so they can communicate and show what they're good at. But I think we are very far away from having it at scale. We see a lot of brands on the marketing side, they do one pilot and then they scream to the world, I made a commitment from 2030 that I'm going to do great. I will be carbon net zero. I'm going to only source from regenerative ag and so on. But if we look to the reality, it's very far away. Like it's the majority of the products are just pilots. And I think that's where I think we need collaboration of Solomon and other areas. It's like we need frameworks and there has to be legislation and what should be considered that you are doing or not doing, how to keep track of that. Like data can bring the transparency, but we need to set up standards and evaluation committees and everyone to be following that up. So if a brand made a commitment and they, me as a consumer will trust them, I should check if they're actually making something. And the market should be regulating itself but that's another area where we have been discussing. I'm sure everyone is aware of the upcoming COP26 and all the discussions among countries on agreeing on a regulation for the carbon markets and nature-based solutions. So if you want to, to take one step further of that, we need the engagement of public and private partnerships there to create those standards and regulate those markets. So then we can actually demand from everyone to, to be doing what they say they are doing. Otherwise, like the trust is shallow because you have to believe. And for many, many years, I think we have been deceived in, in the industry. Uh, there is a genuine, I think, uh, intention of getting better from everyone. But we have been with good intentions for over a decade right now. And if we actually want to limit climate change and global warming and feed everyone, we really need to put these things to scale. I, I couldn't agree more, Mariana. Um, one of the boards that I have the privilege to be on uh, is called OpenSC, and it's all about supply chain transparency. And they've done amazing work in tracking fish from catch and demonstrating that it was or wasn't caught in sustainable waters all the way to the consumer, um, or demonstrating that um, uh, coffee growers and small shareholder farmers who are growing that are getting paid a fair wage, all being protected with the integrity of blockchain through the consumer chain. It's really exciting, but it's still just beginning to scale. And it is that kind of visibility and transparency, I think, that gives us all that confidence. Um, Salman, I'd love to get you in on this. Uh, Mariana referenced sort of how important that public-private partnership, the policy framework can be. So I'd just love to see if you have had any reactions to, to her thoughts. Uh, do you have mute? 
That's my trick. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I I was listening to her uh, talk about this uh, idea of transparency and creating measurable goals and reporting data. And, and frankly, I, on the other side of it, was thinking governments need to uh, make things less rigid. Oftentimes, it's governments that are coming in uh, preventing uh, growth, uh, it, at least in the PPP space. Uh, but I appreciate the comment, though, because I think that's what's needed in the long run. I'm looking at this sort of post-pandemic as an immediate short-term resolution, but I very much appreciate our comments that there is transparency that's needed. And I'll be honest, I wasn't quite thinking that long term. So I acknowledge uh, <laughs> my short sightedness on that issue. I, I, I do think though, there needs to be uniformity when we're creating these frameworks, right? Uh, uniformity is a big thing for uh, in, in the PPP world, I think. And uh, while there needs to be rigidity, there needs to be some flexibility at finding that balance happens with, again, my point of in local cultures, it needs to be different. You know, a PPP model may work in South Asia, but may not, but that same model may not work in Latin America. So I think you and I will have to agree to come to some sort of a balance between being rigid enough, but reporting it enough. So at least there's some data to be collected. Thank you. I'm, I'm realizing we're running very tight on time. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. I'd love to see if we can squeeze in a speed round. Um, and what I would love to hear from, from each of you um, is what is the, the one thing that you think is most important, just a phrase, just the sentence, not the whole explanation. Uh, one thing that you think is most important, reducing the inequities that we're currently experiencing around the world. I'll start with you, Diana. Yeah, um, well, I think the most critical right now really is jobs and getting displaced workers back, especially those that are most vulnerable back on their feet again. So jobs. Okay. Mariana? To add to what Diana said, then I would say digital inclusion, because I believe many of the lost were jobs, uh, lost were uh, obsolete. And it's really hard to re-engage all of the, the workforce back. So I think we need digital inclusion so they can access and, and achieve better and higher paying jobs. Salman? I think I reflected on this earlier, home ownership. Okay. And Karen? I agree with, with the jobs and I will add to that the uh, access to the, to the vaccines, the immediate uh, immediately it's so important, not only for the developing countries, but God forbid we have another uh, setback. So uh, just the whole system needs to have the access to the, so we have to get to the vaccines and, and be able to collaborate around that and not compete with that. So I would say that's immediate so we can have. And I would double down on all of those answers, and I would just add one intangible on top of that, which is the, the continued shared sense of connectivity that I think we have gained during this pandemic. And if that's one of the positive things we can keep as we grow out of it, um, I would certainly be grateful. But I want to say just a huge thank you. First, uh, uh, regrets for Miriam, who clearly had such technical problems she couldn't join the panel today. But a huge thank you to Salman, Diane, Karen, and Mariana for joining us and uh, providing such a lively and informative discussion today. Thank you. I know I learned a lot from each of you. Thank you, Wendy. You were wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.